Good morning, and welcome to a day of commemorating the life and teaching of Buddha Dasa Bhikkhu. Thinking about how today might happen has been um, kind of a bewildering thing for me. So right now I have lots of ideas and not much of a plan. I have a plan for getting started. And then a lot of it will be up to you. Part of the plan, so to speak, is the some of the pictures and verses that are posted mainly in the other room. They're there for those of you who are only somewhat or or vaguely familiar with Ajahn Buddha Dasa. Uh, so when you have time during the breaks over lunch, please please take a look at um, some of those verses and sayings. It'll give you some hints of what he was about. And if there's anything that strikes you that you would like to have brought in and elaborated, um, that's one way I'm hoping things can be more more two-way instead of me just talking and talking, which I'm capable of doing. But at some point, it, 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 it might get boring. So please check those out when you have a chance. Also, a few uh, pictorial biographies were made about him, and I've brought them. If, if you could, they're on the chair right there. One has English captions. Uh, the other two don't. Um, one of them was specific. Could you just pass them around? And so as we're going through this, I think I'd like to just have these books circulate and look at them as much or as little as you like. And for the same purpose uh, as the poems and things that are posted, One of them, which is in the front row right now, was made for his 80th birthday, which was turned into a, a much bigger event than he wanted. And he made this kind of book, uh, this book as a thank you to his students. And parts of it are translated, but, and on the Suanmok website. Unfortunately, the translations aren't here, so you can just sort of see the pictures. And then the other book with a green cover is mainly from his cremation, though it also has biographical stuff. So I thought I would just circulate them and you can at least look at the pictures and maybe it'll spark some interest or those of you who've been to Suen Mok or to Thailand, or were born in Thailand, um, it might it might stir up some memories or thoughts that you'll you can share as we go. Third, I, I've thought up some questions, and a couple of them I'll say now. And then they may also provide us with with um, opportunities for uh, exploring Ajahn Buddha Das's work, his teaching in in different ways. I'll come back to some of these later, but I'd like to present uh, three questions. We won't go into them just yet, but. I'll, I'll read them so they're maybe bubbling away in the back of your mind. First question is, are there any seeming contradictions or nonsensical pieces 
to you how you've heard uh, Theravada Buddhism presented. Um, it's meant to be a little bit provocative in the official sort of orthodox position. Of course, there would be nothing contradictory or especially nonsensical. I was looking for a word that means basically it doesn't make sense, it doesn't compute very well. But for me and many people I've met over the years, there are things we hear from different teachers or even in the suttas or some of the the early teachings verse some of the later historical developments, there are pieces that strike some people as contradictory or confusing. So I want to put out the question, are there things like that that have been confusing or seem contradictory for you? And I, I raise this question because for me, Ajahn Buddhadasa resolved a lot of those, maybe not all of them, but a lot of the, what for me seemed like contradictions <clears throat> or aspects of Thai Buddhism that didn't make a lot of sense to me when I first went to Thailand in the Peace Corps and then later found some deeper approaches to Thai Buddhism especially that of Ajahn Buddhadasa. So if there are elements like that, uh, we might take some time later for you to uh, mention things that don't always seem to make sense to you. And if it's possible, I'll pull out aspects of Ajahn Buddhadasa's teachings that at least seem to me to resolve at least partly, some of those contradictions. Now, there are schools of uh, Buddhism that sort of thrive on contradiction or play around with it, but that's not been the Theravada way. And the kind of Theravada orthodoxy would say that there shouldn't be any contradictions. I won't go quite that far, but some of them, I think, uh, are are unnecessary and aren't just Zen-like um, teaching styles. <clears throat> A second question is what are your most important questions and concerns about life, about the world and society, about death, about truth, about meaning and purpose. And if if that brings up anything, maybe maybe Ajahn Buddhadasa and his approach to Buddha Dhamma would have something to to say. And my third question for now is what what have you heard about Ajahn Buddhadasa um, and what brought you here today? Did you just walk in the door to see what was happening or was there there's something specific about something you've heard about Ajahn Buddhadasa or you've been to Thailand and were introduced to something. So I'll, I'll leave those questions just in the air for now. And I'd, I'd like to take a while <coughs> to provide some background and context. I believe that Ajahn Buddhadasa um, arose in a 
in a and out of some specific historical and cultural contexts, which are different than the one that most of us, or I would say all of us, are living in. And that would be true even if we were living in Thailand. The Thailand of 1906 when he was born, <coughs> the Thailand of 1926 when he ordained in the customary way, or the Thailand of 1932 when he gave up on Bangkok um, institutional Buddhism and went back to his hometown and started a small forest monastery. That Thailand is long gone. I would say even the Thailand of 1980 when I went there for the first time is pretty hard to find because things have even changed so much in, in my relatively short experience with Thailand and Thai Buddhism. I believe it's important for those of us who are exploring Buddhism here in the West that we, we explore some of the richer uh, sources of Buddhism from Asia. And in my case, especially Theravada Buddhism. I know that that isn't always uh, of interest to everyone. A lot of people are Americans and we just want to kind of do our American Buddhist thing somehow. But I'm of the bent that believes having some roots and knowing some history is is valuable. And I also think it's important to understand like the Asian teachers that are referred to, where they came from. And I don't just mean the country or the region they come from, but what was going on socially and culturally. And then to look around at what's going on in our society, in our culture, or in our subcultures here in North America, so that we're not too naive about things that are happening to Buddhism here in America. So we can learn both from what's going on here, but also what's gone on before. Unfortunately, the historical record doesn't go back that far. Uh, we have the most, most of it is where we have detailed knowledge just goes back to the 1800s. Uh, there's not much information except for the old chronicles from Sri Lanka which are historically a little bit questionable or the royal chronicles from places like Thailand which are also questionable, um, in both cases largely for political reasons. Um, the people who wrote these had agendas and we can't assume that they were always objective. Anyway, well, I'm not going to go back into all that, but I would like to provide some setting for Ajahn Buddhadasa's life and the child who was born in 1906 and grew into somebody called Ajahn Buddhadasa. First, I'd like to um, introduce the term that I'm most used to referring to him as, which is Tanajan. This is not usually the standard uh, way that monks or lay people refer to senior teachers. But this is how we refer to him at Suen Mo. Ajahn is a Thai word that comes from the Pali Ajariya, which means teacher. Um, Tan is 
purely Thai word, and it it can roughly be translated venerable, but it's not just used for monks. It it could be used for your parents, especially when talking about them in the third person, but also in the second person to address someone or speak of them in a respectful way. One would say tan, not you, not the ordinary you word or the ordinary him word or her word. So Tanajan roughly translates as venerable teacher, uh, but it's it doesn't it's not as it's a little bit formal or respectful, but it's not uh, too formal, and it's a little bit of the style of Suan Mok that, in some ways, Ajahn Buddhadasa was a bit formal, um, and then there are other ways he was rather informal and iconoclastic. So I'll tend to speak of him as Tana John. And now you know you know why. He was born in an area of Thailand that has quite old and interesting cultural roots. There was an empire called Sivichaya, which was the dominant political entity in, in Southeast Asia between India and China, approximately 1200 to 14 or 1500 years ago. And in some of the old Chinese, um, the monks from China who would go visit India, some of them who went by sea stopped off in Sivichaya to learn learn Pali before going on to India. Some scholars believe that Sivichaya was based in what's now Sumatra. But other scholars, including Ajahn Buddhadatta and his brother, who were both amateur anthropologists and archaeologists, or more archaeologists than anthropologists, and the brother especially, whose name was Damadasa, was a, probably the most knowledgeable historian of the, the area where they both grew up and lived their lives, which is the Ban Don Bay of southern Thailand. It's, if you, the elephant's trunk of the Thai, of southern Thailand, there's an area where it widens out. It's also where a lot of the islands are where uh, foreign tourists go, such as Ga Samui, Ga, Ga Pangan, and on the west coast, Phuket. Um, some scholars, including Ajahn Buddhadasa's brother, believe that Sivichaya was based in the area where they grew up. Now that could be some hometown pride, but there are there are actually more ruins there than there are in Indonesia. And so they feel they have a much better archaeological case. I bring this up because unlike our culture, where everything's pretty new and we tend to forget things that are 10 or 20 years old, it seems. Um, some of us may be no cultures, either through birth or family or travel, that have long, long uh, memories. But I think it's important for Americans to try to get a sense of teachers like Ajahn Buddhadasa had a sense of being part of an ongoing culture that went back hundreds of years. Thailand as a political entity only goes back, um, in some ways, back to 19, uh, the 1940s when, for, for political reasons, the name of the country was changed. In other ways, it goes back 200-something years to the forming of the Bangkok uh, dynasty that's currently still the royal family, the Jakri dynasty. 
or earlier 700 years, maybe a thousand, depending how you look at it. But in the part of southern Thailand where Ajahn Buddhadasa grew up, there was also before that the Sivichaya Empire, which was not Thai. Um, I, I don't know what language they spoke. It may have been a Malayan type language. But this, Ajahn Buddhadasa grew up and played among ruins that were 1,200 years old. Or when he would take his family's cows out to pasture. His, he was from a merchant family, but they also raised cows. You know, take the cows out to the fields and you walk by some old stupas that are 1,200 years old. That, I think, has an influence and an impact. And it's much different for, for us because we, we participate in Buddhism here as a, a minority religion or tradition. Whereas for somebody like Ajahn Buddhadasa, it was the way of life and it had been the way of life for as far back as anybody could remember. The way Catholicism was the way of life for most Irish or Italians up until very recently. The area he grew up in, um, the Bandon Bay area, had been an important administrative center for, South, for southern Thailand for a long time and an important trading area. And it spoke its own dialect of Thai and people were very proud of it. In some parts of Thailand, when people would leave the countryside and go into Bangkok, they would try to hide their country accent. But not people from this part of southern Thailand. There's the, the guy who's still the local MP, one of them who has claimed to be my student, which is a little bit of an embarrassment um, because of his uh, corrupt habits. But these are guys who in parliament, they're proud to speak in a dialect that half of the other MPs can't understand. And of course, they use that for uh, doing their political things. But I'm trying to convey a sense that an area that was proud of its culture. And Anjan Buddhadasa was proud of the culture he came from. And this was important because he was born not long after a, an event where the British ran a gunboat up the Chao Phraya River, which is the main river of central Thailand, and parked it and shot a cannon at a palace. I forget exactly where. And this was humiliating for the Thais because what the British were doing there, like they and the French and us now had done all over Asia, was come in with guns and say, we can do whatever we want. And if you don't like it, tough luck. And uh, this is called the Bowring Incident. He, he was born 10 or something years after that. And on one hand, there was all this stuff coming in, European manufactured products, European literature, science, new ways of thinking about time. Uh, before then, the Thais had their traditional Buddhist, Brahmin cosmology that was based in traditional ideas about karma and rebirth. But then there was all this new stuff coming in from Europe, along with the new economics, the new trade. Thailand had always been a trading center with China, with India, with Japan way before the Europeans came. But the Europeans just added a whole nother level um, and breadth to that. But they also brought in, in a way that was perhaps unprecedented, although the 
Thai culture has tended to have a lot of respect for India because the Buddha was from India. So in certain ways, there's a bit of cultural hegemony from India, a tendency to see Indian culture as superior in some ways. But when the Europeans, especially the British came, they came with the message, we are superior. And to this day, there are still many Thais who believe that. Whether that message is conveyed by Walt Disney or McDonald's or um, all the other, uh, Starbucks is there now and all those kinds of things. So it's in a piece, one reason I'm getting into this is as some Thais started to question, is it true what the Europeans say? Especially Thais who were sent off to Europe to learn modern, modern subjects, modern bureaucratic administration, engineering, medicine, science. Was it true that um, the Asians are, you know, they're a bunch of non-believers? They're an inferior culture. Was this true? For somebody like Ajahn Buddhadasa, there was just a simple no way. And this, this grew out, I think, that he was a southerner. I don't think that's the only reason, and I'm not implying that people from other parts of the country didn't have a similar pride in where they come from. But it influenced Ajahn Buddhadasa, and later in the 30s and 40s, he, he was an important influence in a certain kind of Thai nationalism. Nowadays, nationalism often carries a negative connotation where we think of nationalism as a basis for aggression, um, xenophobia, and things like that. But I, I think there's a healthy form of nationalism that Ajahn Buddhadasa represented, which is a real affection, or patriotism just means love of one's fatherland um, or motherland or homeland, whatever we want to call it, which I think is a perfectly natural and healthy thing when uh, the ego and defensiveness and all that stuff doesn't take over. So Ajahn Buddhadasa had, and because of the nature of the Thai polity, Patriotism isn't really the right word, but there was a natural pride in being Thai, in being a Southern Thai, and a respect for the culture, a respect, a deep respect for ancestors and what they had passed on. So Ajahn Buddhadasa spent all his life trying to pass on and remind and convey aspects of the older culture that he felt were still valid and being lost. And this was important because he did it as a major Buddhist teacher. And he wasn't the only one doing that, of course. But he also did it as one of the first, if not the first, important Buddhist teacher in Thailand to really study Western culture mainly through books, but he was widely read. Um, he read stuff like Shakespeare. He read the Bible many times. He read Western philosophy. He knew a fair amount about science back in the 20s and 30s. He read Freud. And he read all of this critically. And so the mix of uh, healthy pride in where he came from and the culture of his family and ancestors mixed with a pretty sharp or even brilliant mind who 
was willing to read and study meant that when sometimes we're asking, are we really inferior to the West, to Europe? He, he was the most important response to say, well, we, we can't match them in technology, at least right now. We can't match them in, in uh, weapons and military might. But we have a healthy Buddhist culture that's been thriving for hundreds of years and has kept the teachings of the Buddha alive and done so with a fair amount of flexibility. Ties are not by nature a dogmatic culture compared to the other major Theravada countries Thailand strikes me as the least dogmatic. It's also the least philosophical. Most of the philosophers in Thailand have Chinese blood, including Ajahn Buddhadasa, who was half Chinese. Um, So there's a kind of intellectual openness and flexibility. Thailand is much more about emotion. Um, It's also a very sensual culture. So philosophy... Theology, they're not going to get bent out of shape about stuff like that, which is allowed for a um, certain amount of creativity. And this was very important. Um, if you go into some of the ways that Ajahn Buddha Dasa took critical and innovative approaches to Theravada teaching, um, he would have been arrested in Burma. I've heard of of friends of mine who know Burma much better than I uh, talk about outlaw monks who are forbidden by the government to teach to groups larger than five because they do not hold rigidly orthodox Theravada views. And I think in Sri Lanka where it's not, it's not like that, but there's... um, it would be tough to to um, to propose the perspective that Ajahn Buddhadasa has become known for. If you're not yet familiar with what those are, we'll get to them in a little while. Another piece, um, two more things I want to add for three more to this context. Just before he was born, there was a flowering of meditation practice in his area. There was a very charismatic monk who got a lot of people to meditate. So in all the, lo- all the local monasteries, and Thai Buddhism is very much centered on the the monastery, the Wat. Um, and Wat in Thai means a place where monks live. So it's, you can translate it as temple, but it's also a monastery. And generally, it's not a meditation center. Um, most Thai Wat don't have a whole lot of meditation going on. Um, forest monasteries do, but not, not the standard Wat. And that's more or less true here in America as well. So, um, through the influence of this monk, every Wat, the front would have the more public areas with the the buildings that would u- be used for ceremonies and and things, offering food. And But in the back, there would be at least a couple acres that were left to be more wooded or not quite jungle, but a lot of big trees, but cleared between, and these were used for meditation. That, I think, had an influence on Ajahn Buddhadasa. It's the, the prominence of meditation practice, both with monks and lay people, tends to ebb and flow. Uh, the notion of long teaching lineages is not 
strong in Thailand. Generally, you have a teacher and you might know about your teacher's teacher, but you don't go much further back than that. So when uh, an influential teacher would encourage a lot of meditation, there would be a, a flowering of a lot of people meditating in that area. It might just be one village or a township of six to eight villages or a district of six or eight townships or even more broadly. That had more or less petered out, not completely by the time Ajahn Buddhadasa was becoming a young man. But he heard about it from his mother who was very devout and from older monks. And so that was part of the, the cultural atmosphere. Another piece that he liked to talk about a lot, and in some of those books you'll see pictures of this. At Suen Mok there's a pond that was dug and in it was left a little island and there's a single coconut tree growing from the island. And this is from a traditional southern Thai lullaby about the nalike palm. Nalike is a kind of coconut in southern Thailand. The nalike palm stands alone in the midst of the sea of wax. The thunder can't reach it. The rain doesn't touch it known only by those who have gone beyond all merit. So that was a lullaby that they're sing when they'd rock the kids in the little uh, cloth cradles under the houses. They would sing this kind of lullaby. Ajahn Buddhadasa liked to point out that if, first of all, this was about Nibbana and non-duality. And they're singing it to a uh, kids in the cradle. Now, I'm not claiming that all the, all the infants uh, understood this with their mother's milk and the lullabies. But he thought this was a source, uh, this is something Thai Buddhists should be proud of, that the ancestors had the capacity to weave Dhamma teachings into even children's lullabies, traditional art forms like pap uh, shadow puppets, which came from India, and uh, popular sayings and so on. And, and that, that's a little piece of Suan Mok later that he tried to remind people of some of these cultural things that weren't just culture for culture's sake. What mattered for him was when the culture served Dhamma, um, especially Buddha Dhamma. The last thing I want to mention is the influence of his mother. His father died when he was 16 and he didn't talk so much about his, his father although the father clearly had some influence. Partly, it was through his father's family that he was sent up to an important Bangkok monastery to learn the Pali language and where for a little while uh, the door opened for him to get into the institutional system and become an important Bangkok monk, which he probably had the the talent and definitely had the, the brains for, but he, he didn't have the stomach for it. So he, uh, he went home. But he did have that opportunity and that was important for him. That came from his dad's side of the family, which were, were the Chinese merchants. But his mom's side was the connection, was more strongly the connection with the culture and also she raised him. So over the years he spoke a lot about his mother. One of the main things he talked about was her thriftiness. Uh, for example, 
and she was she was also known for her sweets and some of her cooking and which she sold in their little store uh, most local cooks would take the meat of the coconut and you grate it and squeeze it to get the coconut cream out which is a major major element in Thai cooking, especially sweets. It's called gati. And, but she would do it three times, except it was Ajahn Buddhadasa and his brother who had to do the squeezing when, starting when they were five or six. I guess she must have done it before then. But he would bring up lots of things like this and, um, you could see the influence on him when he died his room, he just had all kinds of stuff that he would saved over the years, his personal notebooks. He would never go out and buy a notebook. But in Thailand every year, different companies would print kind of the tear, the calendars with tearaway sheets. That was his notebook. He would be, he would have those and he'd, he'd keep his notes. So when he died, there was boxes full of these tearaway sheets some of which have now been photocopied and printed into 400-page books. So um, those of us who like to do it can thumb through there and see his notes from the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s. And most of it would show up in talks at some point. So you could kind of see how he would... Most of these aren't dated, so you can't work it through that way. But you could kind of see how some of his thinking, he would try it out in his notebook before it would become a, a talk. Now that's of course a, a somewhat different style than what is common, I think, in the the usual Thai forest tradition and um, Venerable Tirapanyo can correct me if I'm wrong. But generally, I don't think they do as much on the notebooks and um, in some places it's frowned upon. But Ajahn Buddhadasa was one, he felt if you have a good idea, write it down, ponder it, especially if it's an idea about Dhamma. And so when he would go on alms round, he would take a pen with him. And sometimes he would come back with stuff scribbled on his hand and then he would copy it into his notebook. Uh, he advised that I do the same thing, but I, I would usually carry a key piece of paper and scribble it on that. But I, I didn't have as many ideas as, as he did. So anyway, back to mom. Uh, thriftiness. And she was very devout. She was also very strict. Uh, when he was a kid and wanted to learn to play one of the musical instruments, I forget which one, he had to sneak out of the house. Uh, she was so strict that she felt that um, music was was too much of a distraction and therefore one should not indulge in it. He, by the way, uh, liked to sing and he even, we even have him on tape uh, singing a song, a part of a love song from the 20s. Um, someday, he used it, he gave it a Dhamma twist, of course, in the talk, but uh, someday I know you'll love me was the song. And it was about um, a Dhammayata, which you may never have heard about, but it's a, it's a fairly obscure Pali word that he he was championing for a while, trying to get people interested. And it, it, I translate the word as unconcoctability. The mind that's had profound insight realizes and becomes a tamayata, which means nothing can stir it up, nothing can concoct it. And, and he, so he used this, this, uh, I think it was from Britain, this corny love song from the 20s. So, so anyway, those are some things about his background. Um, mainly things that may not be generally available in print. 
And so I wanted to give you some sense of where he comes from culturally, historically. It's, it's vitally important to understand what happened in Theravada Buddhism over the last hundred years to realize that all the Theravada countries were colonized or like Thailand not formally colonized, but subjected to constant pressure from European and later North American societies that arrogantly considered themselves superior. There were important exceptions of European and American visitors who, who didn't have that attitude, but they were the exception. And a lot that happened in Theravada Buddhism and Ajahn Buddhadasa grew out of that and matured as a teacher during, during this. The, um, and he was very aware of it that the whole world that Buddhism had known was being changed by this, this powerful and fast-paced change, which only accelerated through his lifetime. And I think has made it very hard for Theravada Buddhism to adjust. And there's a lot of people who just want to go back to the past. Much of the youth is just going to the mall um, and doesn't know anything about Buddhism. And then there are some somewhere in the middle in Ajahn Buddhadasa's, I think, the most important one, trying to straddle the Buddhist roots of Southern and Thai culture and modernity and all that it means. And I think some, in some ways, although we're, we're a bit more postmodern here, if you use that term, um, but we're still struggling with that, I think. And that's why I think learning about teachers like Ajahn Buddhadasa can help us find our way with the Dhamma in, in our society. So I'll, um, that's enough on that piece, at least, unless there are questions, any pieces of that you'd like to pass the mic. I spent some time in Bangkok and uh, met um, your Acharya Longpur Panya, and uh, he was kind enough to give me about half a dozen books which you had translated from Buddha. Uh, so I want to thank you for your translation work. It was very helpful. Um, I want to ask you about, but uh, apparently Buddha does, uh, um, uh, learn Pali. Could you say something about the translation of uh, a rendering of Pali into Thai, which is what I think he studied? And then um, my understanding also is that he was pretty much self-taught in Pali. Kind of. Uh, back then and even now, the way to advancement in the Thai institutional monasticism was through learning Pali. And it doesn't, in my mind, make a lot of sense how learning Pali qualifies you for administrative positions. But that's basically been and even now remains the situation. That's not about being abbots, but being higher levels of administrators. Um, when Anton Buddhadasa was a young monk, the learning was completely rote. So you just memorized. And then when the time came to take the test, you, you gave them back what they wanted. And the, so when he went up to learn Bangkok, or went up to Bangkok to learn Pali, because he was, 
when he was a young monk, he was clearly very smart. He was giving, he was a popular uh, preacher his very first rains retreat. He was, um, so he was precocious um, as a teenager and as a monk. And um, let me slip in a little story because I might forget it later. Um, a friend of mine, Bracha Hutana Wat, who's kind of, he uh, put together oral memoirs of Ajahn Buddhadasa, which I have here, and is responsible, partly responsible for the pictorial biography. When Bracha was doing these memoirs, he tracked down an old schoolmate of Ajahn Buddhadasa's. And this, this is like from first grade. Ajahn Buddhadasa had four years of formal schooling. His name was Nguyen. Uh, his family name was Pani. So young Nguyen went to school with some of the best sweets because his mom was good at making sweets, traditional Thai sweets. And Ajahn Buddhadasa would bribe his friend to listen to him tell um, fables. So there's something about Ajahn Buddhadasa that liked to talk, even even as a, a young kid. And um, he's not the only uh, Thai teacher that would give two and three hour talks, but uh, he could he didn't mind giving uh, long talks. So anyway, back to Pali. So he was sent up to Bangkok to learn Pali, but through his uncle who for a number of years had been a fairly important monk at an important uh, Bangkok Wat, one where there was a good Pali school, that uncle arranged for him to have a private tutor. So instead of going to the regular class, which I've never been to, but I assume the teacher would be at the front and he would just repeat stuff and people would repeat after them and they would, I've seen it in other places, uh, traditional rote learning. So he didn't go to that. He studied on his own with a very small group of students with this private tutor who was considered to be a very good poly teacher. So he had the help of that teacher for two years. Um, But partly because it was his uh, character, his both his precociousness, and because even as a teenager in his family store, they sold Dhamma books. So all the books that he was supposed to study as a young monk, he had already read a couple times over as a teenager. Uh, and he, he liked to uh, debate with the adults who also read the book. And they thought it was kind of cute, this kid who could talk about Dhamma. But he was debating with people who were educated, the local. It was an, at that time an administrative center for a large chunk of southern Thailand. So he was meeting up with people who were considered well-educated in Thailand of the, around the time of World War I or just after. So... Um, so he went up, he he had some poly learning. And because of his, the things I just mentioned, he started reading the suttas in Pali. When I first heard that, I thought, well, that's a perfectly normal thing to do, right? You learn the scriptural language while well, you read the scriptures. But that was not the normal thing to do. Because when you studied Pali, you didn't actually study it about the suttas. The texts they use were what are called the Dhammapada commentaries. You all know the Dhammapada. There are also a traditional body of stories that go with all the, every stanza. There's a story that goes with it. Those stories were written down in a much later form of Pali, the Pali of the commentaries, which is a thousand years. It's linguistically different from the Pali of the suttas. I don't know how it's different. I'm not that much of a scholar, but 
supposedly it's different. And so it's easier to learn. And because they're stories, it's narrative. And it's much easier to learn a language when you've got verbs and actions and, and stuff like that rather than talking about I and form, the interaction of I and form gives rise to I consciousness. The meeting together of these three is eye contact and then feeling, craving, clinging, um, let alone Abhidhamma or something like that. So he started reading the suttas and started to question the point of memorizing and then just uh, repeating back the expected stuff. So the first year he took the poly exams, he got the highest score in the country. The second year he flunked in, intentionally by because he answered what he, he gave his own ideas. And so he answered back what he thought was right. And, and that's a little bit of his stubbornness. He wouldn't have become who he was if he wasn't uh, somewhat pig-headed or stubborn. And, but he also had that self-confidence to, and he had that support from his family, his culture, um, kind of, well, we don't have to let these Bangkok guys push us around um, or tell us how to think, let alone the Europeans. And so after that, he was more or less self-taught. And, and one reason he's, he was different and didn't just follow the orthodox Theravada take on things was he was reading the scriptures, the suttas for himself rather than just being told what was, the, what was in there like the way it used to be in the Catholic Church where nobody would read the Bible. The priest would, would, you know, tell you the word, but you shouldn't go and read it yourself. You might misunderstand. And that's, that's been not an uncommon attitude in Theravada countries, that ordinary people aren't able to understand this for themselves. They need, they need somebody else to explain it. Ajahn Buddhadasa disagreed with that throughout his life. Um, another story I had heard uh, was that um, Ajahn Buddhadasa uh, and then Monk Burapanya and then there was a third monk who were part of a reform movement. And I don't know if this came after he spent the time in Bangkok, but um, apparently the three of them tried to reform the monks uh, in, uh, or the quality of monks in uh, Thailand. And uh, I guess the third one passed away uh, fairly early and then Long Purpanya is still alive. And then, uh, can you perhaps relate the history of that? Sure. Um, the other's monk's personal name is Bun Chuen. And he came from Chumpon, which is the province directly north of Suratani which is the province where Ajahn Buddhadasa was from. Um, Luang Pho Panya or Panya was from further south, Patalung, which is the poorest province of southern Thailand. And it's just north of the, the areas where there are a lot of Muslims. There are a fair amount of Muslims in Patalung. So, when... This all happened after Ajahn Buddhadas had left uh, Bangkok and started Suen Mok, which happened in 1932. And he lived alone for about two years. But very early, he and his brother started a magazine. And that's how a lot of people found out about them and about Suen Mok. And one of the first people to visit and spend time there was Long Pa Panya, although he was, I think at the time he might have still been a novice. He was either a novice or a very young monk. He's about five years younger than Ajahn Buddhadasa. Um, 
so he visited, and I think at the same time, at this part I can't remember for sure, I think actually Bun Chuan in brought, he, he and Long Pa Panya had known each other, and they came together. And so they spent a range retreat with Ajahn Buddhadasa. Back when Sun Mok was very informal, in the early days, Ajahn Buddhadasa didn't think of himself as a teacher. So he had this place, and if you wanted to come and study and practice, you were welcome. But it was for it was for people, mainly monks, who already had some knowledge of Dhamma and didn't need somebody looking after them. By the way, he kept that attitude all along, that he wasn't there to teach the basics, although he did. But Suen Mok, he envisioned, was for people who had gotten a basic Buddhist education and now wanted an environment where they could explore it more deeply. So, so anyway, uh, Bun Chuan and Luang Pa were two of the very first young monks to go and spend time there. And they became close friends ever since. And because they are all from the South, their idea to reform Buddhism um, was mainly for southern Thailand. And eventually, um, Long Pa Bun Chuan, Long Pa, by the way, is a, a, a somewhat informal, enduring term of respect for senior monks. Pa means father. Luang kind of means venerable, noble. It's another word that's hard to translate. So Long Pa is a little more familiar than Tanajan. Um, Lung Pa Bun Chuan became, he, he lived in Singapore for a long time and then was the monastic governor of Chumpon province for a long time and he was well known as a poet. So eventually his monastic title, which I forget, had the word Gawi in it, which means poet. So they stayed in touch, helped each other over the years. They didn't work directly together, and they only lived together for three months. But especially the youngest, Long Pa Banya, was a traveler. And so he would go back and forth and visit a lot. And Ajahn Buddhadas, in most many ways, was the older brother. He was the thinker the um, sort of the more fill it with more of a philosophical bent, intellectually much more radical. Long Pa Panya was the popularizer. He's 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 for a long time was in a way still might be Thailand's most popular preacher. Um, just his style is very easy on the ear, and. <clears throat> Many Thais know Ajahn Buddha Das's teaching through Luang Pa Panya because he's kind of made it easier and more accessible. And Bun Chuan was the administrator of the three. I was just curious, you had briefly mentioned that he moved from working with an institutional Buddhist-based group and then went into the forest again. I was wondering why. <clears throat> when, when The way he put it, when he was a young monk, he looked at Bangkok as that was, you know, that's where real Buddhism kind of was, here out in the sticks. I know I talked about the local pride bit, so some of what I said there um, might not fit with this completely, but he thought that Bangkok, that's where you go to get a real Buddhist education, and he, he assumed that the monks in Bangkok were more advanced. And But when he got there, his impression was the opposite. The temples were dirtier, they were noisier. The monks kept the Vinaya, the monastic discipline, much more sloppy. 
than the uneducated monks back in the uh, back where he came from. And so the the city, you know, there was wealth, there was new stuff, there was the administrative system if one wanted a institutional career or if one wanted to be kind of influential in 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 that way. But he was very much turned off by the whole institution, which has been the pattern of forest monks over the years. And it's it's a long pattern in religious history, where if you're too close to the political economic power, um, it's easy to get corrupted. And that's always going on, including in Thai Buddhism today, where where the money and the power is, they want Buddhism to serve their interests. And no matter how much um, uh, propaganda we get about the, how wonderful the royalty is or how Buddhist the governments are, whether in Burma, Sri Lanka or whatever, often the reality, not always, but often the reality is one of trying to get the monks to do what the government wants. And so the institution was actually created by the Thai government in the around the turn of the 20th century. And in Ajahn Buddhadasa's view, as well as his friend's view, it didn't do much to serve Dhamma. It wasn't really about training monks, educating monks, educating ordinary Buddhists. It was about the prestige and the titles and the faith of monks who were up in the system. And to get those titles, you had to do favors for the government. There are exceptions to that. There have been some very fine monks who who survived in that system. But the system itself is not basically about Dhamma or Dhamma practice. So Ajahn Buddhadasa saw that. And he, he felt... He, he wrote a letter when he decided to leave Bangkok and he said um, that he, he used the word, he was thinking then in terms of purity. Purity is not to be found in Bangkok and in that system. He had a much better chance of finding that back home or in an old abandoned monastery that the forest had had taken back. And so he, he went back there. It's important, though, to also, because it's possible to kind of turn your back on that system and blow it off completely. At least some people think that's what you should do. He never went that far. He, he was, as um, Thomas Merton would say, he was a marginal figure. He stayed on the edge of the monastic system. And most of the great forest teachers have done that. If you get too far out, it's it's just it becomes a pain in the neck. But you got to be far enough away that the system doesn't corrupt you. And if you really want freedom, freedom to think, freedom to practice, freedom to teach, you need to get some distance from from that institution. So he he kept as much distance as he could. Um, including he he went for many years without registering Suan Mok as a monastery. In Thailand, there's, there's an official registration for monks, for monasteries, for everything to bring it under bureaucratic control or at least oversight. And also, <laughs> the old uh, Department of Religion would was also pretty filthy, so they would pocket... 15 to 30 percent of the money that was supposed to go to temple development. Um, so he didn't register for a long, long time until he was forced to. And But he didn't repudiate the system. He just kept his distance. And he would interact with it when he felt it was worthwhile. Um, the system gave him titles. Also, 
he and other monks like Ajahn Chah were given titles. They didn't seek these things, but the institution sort of wanted to domesticate them would be a, a rude word for it. Um, honor them is the, the usual word, but... But there's a bit of, if all the great teachers are sort of outside the system, what does that say about the system? So, so they give out the titles to make it look like these monks are, have something to do with the, the formal institution. And they all did, but they were very, very careful about it. And teachers like Ajahn Buddhadasa and Ajahn Chah were very savvy about it. They understood power. Um, and they didn't want to get, they didn't want to waste their time playing power games. This may be the last question and then we'll take a, a break. Uh, did he teach at the meditation center across the highway from Swan Monkey? Or, and did he found it? What did he start it? Um, no and no. The Sun Mok International grew out of, was more a, uh, the creation of Ajahn Po, who is now the abbot, and in the 80s and 90s was informally the assistant abbot. Ajahn Buddhadasa was never actually actually the abbot of Suan Mok. And so there wasn't a formal assistant abbot. But Ajahn Po played that role in he liked foreigners and there was a steady stream of foreign visitors from the sixties onward. And Ajahn Po heard about ten day retreats. And so um he got a monk, a young a young monk who's now known as Rodney Smith, to lead a retreat, um, which four people attended. One of whom's one of my best friends, who later ordained. He's a, a Bavarian, who now teaches in Munich, uh, named Viriananda. So, and then the next time they did it was twenty people. These were done on Gossamui, which is where Ajahn Po grew up and is uh, by bus and boat back then was five, six hours from Suen Mok. Later, and this was when, just when I was arriving in 85, the, the retreats went from being three or four times a year on Gossamui to starting to be every month at Suen Mok. And then eventually Ajahn Po asked permission to build the meditation center across the highway about a mile from Suen Mok. The highway is the Asian highway. So originally it was going to go through Suen Mok, but they had it rerouted. So Ajahn Po was the main person behind the retreat center. By the time that was going, which was 89, Ajahn Buddhadasa didn't get around very much. His health had been pretty bad through the 80s. His weight was had ballooned. Um, during his 80th birthday celebrations in 86, he there were concerns for his heart. So every morning or during the retreats, people would walk over. Actually, this started when the retreats were at the Boy Scout camp next to Suen Mok. Ajahn Buddhadasa donated about 30 acres of land to the Boy Scouts because he thought that this would build character and, you know, good, ethical young men. Later he uh, thought otherwise, but he, he was kind of idealistic. He thought, oh, the Boy Scouts were a good thing, so he gave them land. But the Boy Scouts hardly used it anymore. So we did the retreats there for a few years. And so the retreatants would go to him, which for a while was just a five-minute walk. Later it was a 30-minute walk. So wake up at four in the morning, 
walk two kilometers to Suan Mok and Ajahn Buddhadasa would would lecture, usually at 5 a.m. And then at 7 a.m. he would send them back. So some of those talks are on the website if you're interested, both the Suan Mok website and the Liberation Park website. In translation, by the way. Okay. Should we... Let's take a break and for about 15 minutes. And again, I'll check out some of those poems. And when we come back, I'll kind of, I'd like to get some ideas from you, what you want to hear about or what you want to discuss. If you want to just do Q&A all day, I'm quite happy to do that. But if, if you want to focus on certain topics, uh, systematic, a little systematically, that's fine with me too. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to adapt this as much as possible to your interests, your questions, your, your concerns. And also those of you who have something to share about Suan Mok or Ajahn Buddhadasa want to make time for that as well. <laughs>